Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for our webinar today, Budgeting, How to Plan for Inflation. My name is Kelly Blount and I will be today's moderator. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Todd Moore with Trinity Debt Management to introduce himself and take us through today's topic. Thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you for everyone for joining us this afternoon. It's uh, once again, great to be back with General Electric Credit Union. Um, got an exciting topic for us planned this morning. Um, looking at ways that we can get in front of this question of inflation. How might we use budgeting to plan for inflation? Um, if you've been following some of the statistics and watching the news here recently, um, you certainly, I'm sure, have seen that these numbers are are still very high. Um, you know, we think about inflation, it's this general uh, increase in prices overall. And um, we're just figuring out at this point, which way is the wind truly blowing here? Are we getting out of this crisis or do we have to deal with this longer term? But I wanted to start this morning just by sharing some of the numbers with you. And then we're going to go into some of the uh, the ways that we can use budgeting to really kind of temper the consequences, not only the short term, but the long term consequences of inflation and how we might plan for the for the future. So, you know, when we think about inflation, uh, some of the areas that we've been uh, watching very closely is looking at the housing sector, um, looking at food expenses, looking at energy expenses. And then, you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics just tracks hundreds of items, probably more than 400 plus items that we're looking at just to see what is that overall increase in prices? Where are things heading? So we've been monitoring this very closely. I can share with you that um, there is some, well, at least until the jobs report was re released in, in, in July. But right now, I think the, con the consensus is that the inflation rate is we're trying to move towards having that 3% uh, go to 2% towards hopefully uh, the year end uh, in 2024. So Federal Reserve is looking at this and how it might impact particularly the housing market and uh, credit card uh, interest rates. So the trend right now tends to say that we're heading in the right direction, uh, despite the jobs report that we had uh, in July. But we're hoping that we will make that progress um, as we look out towards the end of the year. But prices still remain high, you know, on average prices. And I'm sure that you're feeling the pinch as well. I certainly am in my own family. You know, prices are tending to come down, but we're still um, uh, prices are just higher than they've been, uh, despite whatever small decreases we've seen. And then we're hoping, again, that we can mitigate this inflationary period. This is going to be around for a while, even if the interest rates start to drop. One of the most important reasons we're doing this today is that, again, we can get out in front of this issue and plan for where we might be going in the next couple of years. Uh, most of us uh, over the last couple of years have had some pretty significant, um, uh, pretty significant challenges when it comes to inflation. That's affected our personal finances in many, many ways. And it's also uh, one of the issues that can cause a great deal of emotions. Well, you know, as we look at our savings or we look at our overall personal finances, when inflation goes up and many of us have depleted our savings or we've used credit cards, kind of uh, essentially use our credit cards to get us through periods where we've just had a decrease in our earning power, um, this is the way that. Uh, we've got to figure out a way to use budgeting to kind of project ourselves into the future. So we're going to try to take the emotion out of this as much as we can and respond to the situation reasonably and um, through the budgeting process. So I wanted to start the presentation today just asking us to look at our own behavior. Think about how we respond to a particular crisis, okay? So when we think about our own response to um, uh, inflation. As I said, many of us are starting to make lots of different financial choices, and we're going to cover some of those today. And those choices often come with a financial cost. And that's what I'm trying to caution us against today. Let's just slow down for a moment and take a look at where we're at. The, our budget allows us really to do a couple different things to anticipate those rising costs that will be with us for a while, despite whatever changes we're going to have to deal with costs that are coming 
uh, regardless. Inflation really doesn't go away. There's, there's always a general kind of creep in prices, even when prices come down. And then we also want to figure out how do we make the right choices to project ourselves in the future in a correct way so that we don't have longer term consequences, that we can pay down debts and really just be prepared for other future financial shocks. So one of the things that I would like for us to focus on is really thinking about this idea of how we make financial decisions, what we might call cognitive biases. OK, so um, this really looks at um, the choices that we make under financial stress. OK, so a couple examples of this when we are faced with inflation or with a crisis, we start to see our, our you know, our, our earning power, our money just isn't going quite as far as it used to go. This general creep in prices across the board, just overall, you know, then we start to make certain choices. And where I see this happening quite often is we start to either, you know, limit the amount of funds that we're putting into our investments. We start under investing in our 401k. Um, we cut back on our savings. Uh, we start using credit cards in a way that uh, oftentimes we may say, well, you know, I know in the future I'm going to make more money. If this is what I need to do now, then I'll go ahead and spend. Each one of those choices comes with a trade-off. And what we're looking at here is the choices that we make often have uh, pretty long-term consequences. So what I'd like to do is ask us to kind of correct this, what's called a self-forecasting error. That is that we tend to project ourselves in the future and how much we're going to make into the future that somehow we can just clean up all these other mistakes that we've made at this point. So if we've underinvested, if we've cut back on savings, if we've taken a 401k loan, or we're just not purchasing the insurance products, certain things like that that we need to you know, protect us against future risks. What I would like to do is maybe ask us to really evaluate that type of behavior. Is that the optimal behavior? Does it, is it an overreaction to our current crisis or how does this impact us into the future? So when we think about this idea, the idea that somehow the future will always be better, one of the problems that we make in doing that is that we kind of overstate what is the positive and understate the potential risks that are always around the corner. So I really want you to think about that. Think about what we call projection bias, this idea that somehow things will be much better in the future than they are now, and I can make all these other choices and somehow the costs are less than what they would be in the future. A good example of this is what we call present bias. So right now, current crisis, we're in a cash crunch. So in order to solve that cash crunch, what we will do is we'll start changing our financial behavior. Again, pull money from a 401k, take or, or not invest at the rate that we've been. We'll cut that back maybe heading into next year, or you may have already taken a 401k loan. We have a cash crisis. What do we do to solve that? We start looking at the resources that are actually earning in real time and start pulling from those things to try to solve the this crisis that we have in front of us. So this is that idea again, is the tendency, what we call present bias, the perception um, that we tend to look at the right now as opposed to what will be in the future. We are going to prioritize immediate get what, what we need immediately or immediate reward, the cash that we need right now, as opposed to what those re rewards would be into the future. So, you know, if you apply this concept and you think about um, where you're at right now, certainly we all feel the pinch of inflation. We feel the, 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 uh, the escalating costs. We've been dealing with this now for several years post pandemic, we know that we've had the highest inflation despite whatever tools we're using, you know, in almost 40 years. But the, the, the key here is for us to take a deep breath and not to overreact to the current situation. And particularly what I'm asking for us to do is to continue to invest in our future, not to panic, okay? Not to be thinking about just what is the immediate need, but to look at your uh, financial choices and whether or not those choices are optimal, whether or not those choices will actually um, serve your best interests long term. Now, again, what it, what is really important here is that faced with that crisis and a cash crunch, we're looking at, at the assets that we have, trying to figure out how do we get the most money that we can, or maybe even overspending in certain areas. 
or worst case scenario, as you may say, wow, you know, I'm already in a situation. What's another, you know, $500 on my credit card? I'll pay that off in the future. That's that idea of, of uh, uh, just having a present bias that somehow, you know, things will be better in the future. Well, things are better now, but we don't look at the consequences long term. So let's continue to maintain or increase our contributions. When we think about budgeting, Again, let's resolve this notion of panicking right now. Let's take a look at where we're at, kind of slow this process down, really think about how a budget can um, help us through this process to align the right priorities uh, for inflation. So we want to maintain our 401k uh, contributions as opposed to uh, contributing less. This is going to be one of those ways that we can mitigate the consequences of inflation. So thinking about 401k or your long-term investments in your retirement, continuing to have that as a budgetary priority means that for whatever losses we've had at this particular time, long-term we know that the market will continue to return um, uh, investment returns that will, again, bring that loss back current and continue to move forward. So as you go through this process, continue to make those investments in your 401k. Um, you know, think about that in terms of your bias for the present. Think about the longer term consequences of your financial decision making. The next thing is that we're also going to look at our savings. As we look, think about budgeting, um, keeping savings as a constant in our, as one of our budgetary priorities. The idea that somehow we can start to decrease that savings just to fill some type of cash need, again, having, build, building a savings that is, you know, continue to make those contributions, that's the surest way that we can have cash reserve uh, for whatever hardship may be around the corner, which certainly will be there. So one of the ways we'll show today is that we can get in front of that by using automation and some of the, co the tools that we have through the credit union. The more that we can automate this process through savings, the better that it will, uh, the returns are certainly are much better and it will help you stay in front of inflation rather than seeing your earnings and your overall money eroded through time. So a couple of things um, here when we start to think about how we might adjust to inflation, how we get in front of this, um, use the tools that we currently offer here at the credit union. So we're gonna ask you to go in, look at your overall um, spending habits. During periods of inflation, certainly those habits need to change. So we have to respond to those in increasing uh, prices that are in the market at this time. So we're going to have you go back and periodically look at your overall spending habits. How are they changing? What choices are you making? And then we're going to have to also, um, many of you I'm sure are already doing this, we're trying to make some type of trade-off to figure out how we can make our, our income stretch as far as possible. So we're going to need to have a budget. So if you don't have a budget, I'm going to encourage you to go back and, and take a look at some of the prior webinars that we've offered. Uh, it will show you how to create and set up a budget, shows you multiple different budgets that are available. But at the end of the day, you need to truly have a budget, some working a working set of numbers and use your checking or savings account to go back and kind of audit how are you spending the funds that you currently have. So that looks at our overall discretionary expenses, those sorts of things. But if you're not budgeting at, the, at this time, um, or maybe you want to do it better, uh, take a different approach, please go back and look at some of the webinars that we've uh, produced. I think it'd be very helpful for you to, to structure a budget and think about how you might use your budget to um, adjust it for inflation. So let's dive right into this notion of discretionary spending. So this is where, when we think about, and in our previous discussions about budgeting, again, budgeting is about setting priorities. And um, as I started off, those priorities, we want you to be able to kind of temper um, this uh, emotional response. A budget is going to slow that down and say, okay, we're going to look at this at a, in a factual way, as opposed to maybe overreacting um, and making bad financial decisions. But, the, but a budget will also allow us to make the types of choices and set a plan in place that ensures that our earnings are actually producing returns through our 401k and our investments, and then making the right choices for our overall spending. 
So discretionary spending is very important because this is where we have to make some type of trade-off. When you think about your budget, one of the first things we're going to do is make certain that you know we meet our overall expenses. Discretionary expenses is this funds the funds that you have left after you've basically paid your bills. So what do you do this year? So most of us are making some type of trade-off to figure out how to have some additional funds. You know, you might have to forego travel this year, or you might have to cut back on subscriptions. This is that auditing process. What is what are the items that you can give up now that will produce the greatest long-term gains? Okay, or what can you give up now to gain something else? So right now, when you look at income and expenses, if you're struggling with this idea that you can't make expenses meet, certainly this is this discretionary spending is where we would start. Um, so I've given just a couple examples here, whether you're looking at you know gym memberships or, or subscriptions, things that these are not the, the things that are most important for you to be investing in at this time or spending cash on at this time. So these would always be areas within your discretionary spending where you can make those choices. Um, you could limit those uh, cash expenses in these areas. The other thing too is that when you look at your credit card bills, um, this is that area where I'm, I'm saying again, thinking about financial behavior, you know, using a credit card, you've already accumulated, let's say, you know, you've already gone beyond that 30% that we talk about. Um, we know that as you go out beyond that, delinquency and default, certainly around the corner, the more debt that you carry. If you're in that area where you're saying, okay, I've already spent quite a lot on this credit card. Again, what's another $500? I got to get this done or I need this these funds now. This is where, again, through discretionary spending, you may not have to rely on a credit card if you can make the other cuts somewhere else in your budget. So whether it's travel, subscriptions, whether it's memberships, whatever you can cut, think about that trade-off. And this is why it's so important to look at your budget and then monitor your overall expenses through your, your checking account. Figure out how we may not, you know, how we can avoid putting more and more money on a credit card. Because again, with inflation dropping, we're still going to have to address those longer term debts or longer term consequences of inflation by paying off these, these debts through time. So start with your discretionary expend, your expenses, and uh, that will be one of the best ways to make trade-offs uh, in the coming months. So a great example of this is food expenses. So food expenses right now, <laughs> This is one of those areas where, you know, I've, I've shown that the, the prices here continue about 10% higher than what they were since last year. If you've been out in the grocery store here recently, um, you'll see that there's there's some expenses that are starting to go down, but overall expenses still are high. So you have discretion in how you control those overall expenses. Um, these are the choices that you have to make in order to control uh, the in those that those creeping prices through inflation. So what do you do? One thing I'm going to suggest here is that we actually start thinking about a spending plan. So when you go back and look at your budget, you're looking on average how much you're spending weekly, how much you might spend monthly. You know, start thinking about having some type of spending plan as opposed to maybe just going in and um, making impulse purchases. So some some practical ways that you might be able to do this is just thinking about meal planning so that you avoid impulse shopping. Um, the more impulsivity is in the budget itself, the more you're going to spend. And I, you know, and it, and it comes down to a lot of simple things, but it has a big impact overall in monthly uh, expenses, particularly when looking at your grocery expenses. So start with the plan, look at your overall expenses. On average, what do you need to meet your overall weekly or monthly grocery expenses? And then really try to narrow items down to where you can do some meal planning, use resources to make multiple meals. Again, trying to stretch those dollars as far as we possibly can. But the key here that I want you to think about is impulse buys. You know, that's the quickest way to move us out of our budget or out of a reasonable set of numbers. You know, I know that anytime I take my daughter with me to the store, we make a number of impulse purchases. I can go in with a list and I have a meal plan and I take her with me and then I overspend because we need drinks and other things that are not on the list. You know, all of these things we have to think about um, 
it, it, because it allows us impulse purchases are just going to allow us to it's, it allows us to spend more money we're going to overspend through this process so the more that you can meal plan target the items that you want over the month the better we're going to control those overall grocery expenses now i've talked about this before but um, very important that you keep your money invested so when we think about setting clear priorities through our budget um, we have to anticipate that there's going to be ups and downs in the market. Let, we talked earlier about, you know, trying to get at some lower interest rate and see the housing market improve and just see a glimmer of hope here towards the end of the year. But most economists are saying that there's still going to be ups and downs as we move forward that could go as far as maybe 2026, 2027 before we're fully back into an, an economy that worked uh, prior to what we had in COVID. So anticipate that markets are going to go up and down. This is where you need to use a budget to get in front and plan ahead for future inflation. So going to ask that among, among those trade-offs that you're looking at in your budget after you've made all those discretionary cuts is that you truly keep your investments at a focused rate. Um, so you, know, you don't go in and start minimizing for cash that's needed now that you go in and minimize um, your future investments. Again, we don't want to panic. Keep those investments strong. Continue to invest in your 401k and your savings, and then use those discretionary cuts that we talked about in the previous slide. Go through and cut everything you possibly can to make certain that you have the money to properly invest in what is earning through time. That's one of the surest ways that we can use um, the historic trends to really uh, improve our overall personal finances through time. It's the way that we can beat inflation. Next, we're going to ask you to create an emergency fund. Uh, we've talked a lot through the budgeting process about emergency funds. Um, again, we know that automation is just, there's so many studies out here to talk about the value of automation. And I'm going to try to plug that now. Um, the credit union offers some great ways to do this. I know that there's even ways to use your debit card to um, uh, incrementally you can have some things rounded up that goes into savings you can automate the process to where you're putting money into a separate savings account uh, there's multiple ways to do this but the idea here is that we don't make shortcuts when it comes to creating an emergency savings fund so I know many of us and we've talked about this over the years we really kind of depleted our emergency savings we had a cash crunch and we used those emergency savings through the pandemic um, so many of us are rebuilding our emergency fund at this time. So one of the best ways to do this is to, again, set up that separate account, call and speak with a member uh, at the credit union so that we can set up a separate account, have those funds transferred over, automate that process. You can do that through the credit union. You can also use um, ways to uh, have things directly deposited through payroll to do this. If you need a budget that's set up, you can always reach out to me here at Trinity. I'd be glad to help you set up a budget to create that process to make sure that you're making these types of uh, incremental savings available. You build that emergency savings. You just need a place to start. So I'm gonna encourage you as you look at your overall budget, again, cut everything that we can through discretionary expenses, and then let's focus on what is truly the most important uh, as we continue to struggle with in inflation create an emergency savings fund very very important next um, thinking about credit card debt itself and how we might um, look out into the future long term one of the things again that i've seen over the last couple of years is and you see this in the national numbers as well i think I, I talked about this before you know folks are carrying record high credit card debt and again using credit cards to kind of get us through a difficult situation. So that became a form of supplemental income. But as we think about how we can temper the long-term consequences of inflation, one of the things we need to start to do is we've got to figure out how to pay this down. So another very important thing to look at in our overall budget is to ask, you know, again, what are we doing to minimize the current credit card debts that we have? Um, and I've given a couple different ways of looking at this, trying to connect this back to financial behavior again. So there's a couple different ways. One is what we call the interest rate method. And uh, we talked 
somewhat about this concept before in a previous uh, presentation on credit scoring, but it applies it applies here as well. Interest rate method is where we're looking where we pay off those interest rates with the highest interest rates first. So we rank order highest interest rate and we, we try to pay off the highest interest rate cards or highest interest rate loans first. Second approach to this is where we look at what we call the credit utilization method, where we focus on um, paying down cards where we look at um, our, you know, anything that we have over 30%, how do, we util how do we change utilization itself to try to bring it down to zero? So we would take a card, for instance, it's maxed out, try to pay it down to 50, then pay it down uh, to zero. We don't look at the interest rate at all. We're just looking at how much we've actually used on that particular credit card. So we're rolling things forward to try to pay it down. Either one of these methods is perfectly fine for you to work on, and there's good reasons to use uh, either one of them. What I'm asking you to do is really align your priorities through your budget to make certain that you're doing the work. Um, when we're thinking about minimizing credit card debt, we know that the longer you're paying on that, the more interest and the more uh, through time that it costs you long term. So figure out which one of these if you need any kind of assistance on that always reach out to me that's why you know we're doing the webinars reach out we'll sit down and create a budget try to figure out which one of these methods may work best for you at this time um, just to minimize your overall credit card debts and then if your score allows it um, you know you may even consider a balance transfer when we're thinking about overall credit card debts rather than having a high interest rate at this time if your credit score is higher you could potentially do something with a balance transfer to avoid some of the current um, high interest rates that you're paying and then uh, pay that credit card debt off at a lower rate. Now, cautionary uh, note here is that we know that usually there's going to be some time dimension to a credit card transfer. So if you do have any kind of uh, introductory rates that are in the market at this time, Want to make certain that we pay it off within the time frame otherwise you go back to that higher rate uh, and um, you know it may even be higher than the current rate that you're paying now so any questions on on minimizing credit card debts at all just please put those in the uh the chat or ask those questions at the end of the process but long term this is one of the areas that we want uh you to focus on in terms of thinking about the consequences of inflation is minimizing overall credit card debt. Next, one of the ways that we can certainly get in front of inflation and to whether we're anticipating uh, some creep in the market or uh, we're thinking about the longer term consequences of inflation is to work on our credit score. Um, this goes back again, the better our score, uh, even if we've had a period where we've exhausted some cash or we've made some credit card purchases, the better that we can work on our score, the more likely that, that we're, you know, particularly if you're going to head into a first time home buyer situation or you need a new car uh, or you're thinking, you know, I've, I didn't make any kind of choices during this, this period with high inflation, but I'm certainly going to need these items in the next year or so. Well, now's the time to use your budget to actually work on your score. That's a way to get in front of things, make certain that we can kind of mitigate the longer term consequences of inflation, interest rates. So when we think about your credit score, paying down debts, um, one of the things we might think about here is, again, through that utilization approach, you're carrying a high credit card debt at this point, paying those balances down 50, 30, pay it down to zero, making a plan to actually do that. The idea is the stronger the score, the better um, interest rates that we're going to have and the more opportunities that we'll have for the loan products that you need. So uh, one function of this is that we look at debt to income. So right now, if you have outstanding debts, you know, and you have a future loan, we wanna make certain that our score is stronger, paying down debts, strengthen that debt to income ratio. And again, hopefully we'll have folks on the call that are looking at the housing market as it uh, will improve in the next year. Debt to income ratio is gonna be very important. So it's very important for you to work on your score now, anticipating that larger purchase in the future. Uh, same for car loans or other types of small loans that you may need to uh, do renovations or whatever it may be that is uh, you know, of interest to you at this time, your credit needs. But the better our score, the better the interest rate, and the more opportunities that we have, 
uh, to beat inflation. So any once again, use me as a resource here at Trinity or reach out to the credit union. We'd be glad to work with you on this to take a look at your overall credit capacity. Um, but the key to this is, again, aligning this function as uh, a key goal in your in your budget itself. Without having that budget in place, we're not going to be able to work on your credit score. So if you're on the call today and you do not have a budget in place, reach out to us. Let us help you create and establish a budget so that we can align funds to these priorities to improve that credit score long term. Um, talked a little bit about this already, but the idea of just keeping that utilization uh, rate low. Now, what I mean here is again, think about uh, political or think about uh, financial behavior. Um, right now, when we think about um, credit utilization, again, I've seen so many folks um, kind of look at the situation and say, "Well, I'm already in trouble. So what's a, again, what's another five hundred dollars on my credit card? I'm already, I'm already in a situation." That, again, is one of those cognitive biases that I talked about in the early part of the presentation. Really want to get away from that type of thinking. You know, $500 today through time at a high interest rate, in addition to the fifteen dollars or $2,000 you already owe, we've got a serious longer-term problem. Uh, and if we're trying to get in front of inflation and anticipate future costs, we've got to figure out a way to really work on this area, uh, improve our personal finances. So keeping that credit utilization low you know if you have an issue where um, you need some help with this i'm going to ask you you reach out to the credit union rather than maybe using a credit card with a high interest rate there are other options for you so if you need a, a smaller dollar loan or something that would be um, you know you have a need that a credit need at this point rather than you know continuing to use a credit card to do that you might want to speak with us at the credit union see if there's a better interest rate that can be offered to you or if there's a way that we can make some type of loan available to you uh, rather than having you use credit cards with a very high interest rate at this time so there are other options in the market to meet your credit needs and just encouraging you once again if you have questions about that to reach out to the credit union and find out if you know, I, I, I believe there's probably better ways to solve some of those credit needs at this point, as opposed to uh, using credit cards itself. Now, I want to transition just for a moment into some of the practical tools that you can use that will strengthen your overall personal finances uh, through time. And again, aligning this as closely to budgeting as we possibly can tracking your overall expenses. This is what we, we talked about in that auditing of your of your finances early on. When we're when we're thinking about tracking our expenses, the key the key to this is really just doing this through time, being engaged in that process. The more you're engaged and I've said this many times, you know, the more engaged you are in this process, the more likely you are to shift behavior. And that's what all of this is about, is making those incremental changes, changing the way we approach our personal finances and how that we can have the best outcomes for our personal finances long term. So tracking is a great way to do this. So when you track your expenses, what we're looking for again, those patterns, where are you spending? How are you spending? What's the overall cost? That's where we go back and take you know, a second or a third look at how we're doing this. But the idea is that we wanna to start to look at those patterns to make the necessary changes uh, that will allow us to properly invest again in 401k uh, our retirement our savings our emergency fund those types of priorities so that's really why i'm uh, trying to encourage you to actually track your expenses every dollar that we can save to put towards those other higher priorities is the surest way that we can beat inflation so if you're not using uh your your ge accounts um, optimally, I'm going to say go in and track your expenses. Also use the money management tool, which is available through online banking and the mobile app. Uh, always try to always try to bring that up in presentations. Hopefully, uh, folks are starting to use it again or use it more. But it is a great tool to do the work. So, if that doesn't, if you're not someone who really wants to connect accounts or use online, then let's figure out something that just simply works for you. Um, when you're, when you're doing this work, you got to find a method that you actually connect 
uh, with? You know, what's the one thing that kind of motivates you? So some folks are going to be interested in spreadsheets and online and all sorts of other tools. And some folks may just want to keep things simple. The idea is that you have a date, a dollar amount, and an item. Look for those patterns. You know, use a worksheet. Get a small notebook. Whatever it may take. Just track those expenses through times, uh, time. Categorize your expenses. Where are those expenses at this point? Where are you overspending? How do you make the necessary cuts? And then again, engagement. Are you doing this regularly? You know, you, this is not something that you do for a month and give up. This is something that you have to engage in consistently. So, you, you know, take for the next four weeks to really dive in and do the work. And then you want to change, you want things to become more of a habit that you're engaging in this process long term. And what will happen through that process is that eventually over a couple months time, it will start to show your overall spending patterns, how you're using funds, and then you're going to make those necessary cuts again to meet the higher priorities uh, and beat inflation. So want to share uh, a couple things with you just as you're as we kind of transition uh, to maybe some questions here soon but when we're thinking about practical tips okay again 10 percent increase in overall costs let's think about tracking those grocery expenses if you haven't done this what are some ways that we can track those things through time um, and how can we get a little savvy on how we might save as much money with grocery expenses as possible well, swapping out name brand items for, you know, what we might call generic items. So this, again, there's going to be small savings across some of these items. But when we think about what you might save uh, over a month, uh, a period of time, that's where these savings actually come in. So tracking your expenses. Bulk items, if there's ways, again, this goes back to that concept of mill planning that I talked about earlier buying some items in bulk, trying to figure out how you can do some mill planning to make that work. Um, being savvy about the sales uh, and flyers, many of the places that offer some types of rewards, whether it's Kroger or other places, they kind of target certain things to you. I know Meyer does as well. They look at how you purchase things and then they might offer incentives for you to buy those items. Again, small changes, but they do add up in terms of overall grocery uh, expenses and how you can save more money. And then uh, incorporating some staples into your meals, raw rice and pasta and other things that you might be able to make multiple meals from. Again, just practical tools that you can use by using products and taking advantage of sales to really try to get the most out of your overall uh, grocery budget. Another thing is that um, when we think about inflation, one of the big areas, I talked about this earlier, is energy expenses. Energy is one of those areas consistently that's just continued to go up. Um, you know, electricity now 12.9 increase, natural gas. So energy expenses, as I'm sure you're probably aware, has gone up. So try to look at some practical tips here, whether you adjust the thermostat, uh, but take a look around your home, you know, uh, try to get efficient lighting, seal the gaps, you know, cracks around windows, those sorts of things. Programmable thermostats, if you can make an investment in that. Um, sometimes thermostats can be really uh, dated if you've been in your home for a few years. An investment in this area really can do some work for you and save you some funds through time. But um, really, is this really kind of going and doing an energy audit? Um, this is an area that uh, consistently folks are just spending more and more money on their homes and trying to figure out ways to beat the energy expenses. But um, this is, again, making that trade off, uh, whether you have to deal uh, with a little higher temperature in the afternoon while you're at work. But the idea is, what can I do to beat inflation and save some money? So you have to get creative in this process. But these are just some of the examples. You know, try to keep some of that summer heat out of your home, uh, keep the lights down low, and uh, let's try to save on those energy expenses to the greatest uh, uh, amount possible. Gas expenses, I think we all know uh, the pinch from gas expenses and what that does to our overall finances. You know, if, you, if there's ways that we can limit travel uh, as we kind of work our way through some of these things, gonna encourage you to do that. Again, this is where some planning will um, 
come in handy once again. Impulsive stuff always costs us more money. So if you can plan the trips that you need or even when you're out shopping or doing things, you know, school's starting here soon. So many of us will be out getting things for our kids. The better we can plan that process, the more we'll save on gas, the more we'll save on our overall expenses. So, you know, kind of limit our travel. Let's uh, work around the items that to best of our ability to figure out how we can save on gas expenses. Plan, plan, plan. That's the message I want to share with you today. The better we're doing that and taking all that impulsivity out of things, the more we're going to save. And you'll save on the bottom line when it comes to gas expenses as well. Um, last thing I want to share with you is uh, I want to transition again to thinking about priorities and what it means to make investments in some uh, insurance uh, products itself. You know, now most folks, and I've shared this before, again, trying to move away from um, saying we have a cash crisis or that we panic in, in a period of inflation and we start cutting across the board things that truly uh, that address risk in our in our personal finances. Big part of that is inflation. So, you know, again, when we think about one way to handle this, we want to certainly find a way to automate our emergency savings. We talked here about most folks, you know, 44% of adults not having a thousand dollars in a savings. So if your if your car breaks down, like mine did here recently. Do you have the money in a savings account that you can pull from, or do you have to rely on something with higher interest like a credit card to be able to do that? So as a priority, we want to budget for those unexpe uh, unexpected expenses. One way to do this again is we're going to use our account from the credit union to try to at least have $1,000 in savings by the end of the year. Um, the next thing is that, you know, as I've tried to share throughout the presentation, cutting all those discretionary expenses to the best of our ability, making and confronting the trade-offs so that we have the funds to invest uh, in unexpected hardships, insurance products, for instance. So as you think about inflation and feeling that pressure for cash crunch, again, don't fall into those biases for the immediate reward or that cash, ca the cash that we need right now to solve the problem. Truly think about how to get in front of inflation and one way to do that is making sure that as a budgetary priority that you're investing in the proper insurance. We're doing some risk analysis is really what we're saying here. So your health insurance, you know, be reasonable about how far you may cut that back as we get into a later part of the year. And when we, you know, take a second look at our insurance for 2025, think about the unexpected hardships. This is where we're actually doing some risk planning. Um, uh, we don't know what's around the corner. Make sure you're investing adequately in your health insurance. Disability, disability insurance, a similar uh, you know, type of approach here, um, particularly when we have employer provided plans that offer some type of um, disability insurance, make certain that we're not cutting back from the immediate cash need that we have now. Figure out how we can cut expenses before you um, go cheaply on some of these other insurance products. Um, whether it's homeowner's insurance or even life insurance itself. Um, you know, I've had conversations with folks where they'd say, well, I'm going to give up my term plan. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to continue to make any type of investments in, in, in insurance at this point. I'm just going to go cheap. Well, we don't know what's around the corner and there is risk always around the corner. So we want to be very cautious about, um, you know, making cuts to our health our homeowners or our in other insurance products. This really needs to be a higher priority when it comes to our overall budgets. Make certain that above all things that these items, again, are part of your risk, um, addressing risk in your risk plan. Um, lastly, when we think about just um, how to get ahead of inflation and how to use our budget to do this work, um, we want to think about uh, accelerating loan repayment itself. You know, so folks would say, well, I'm already paying a lot right now. You know, I want to get out of debt. What's the best way to do it? Well, I showed you earlier, you know, whether we look at interest rate or we look at, um, you know, rolling those funds over through credit utilization, there's always ways that we can accelerate loan repayment. So if you are at this point looking to do that, 
reach out to us at the credit union or reach out to me here at Trinity and we'll figure out a way to use budgeting to help you accelerate um, your loan repayment. That is, we'll pay more than the minimum and more towards the principal and decrease the amount of time that you're paying on that overall loan so that you'll have future funds available uh, for other economic shocks um, or to make investments in your 401k that you maybe have lost in the last couple of years. Uh, so it's it's that trade-off. How do we figure out loan repayment? Um, and then if you have instances where you need to refinance, we have options here at the credit union that will allow you some competitive rates to look at refinancing itself. But here is where I um, want to close today and then take some questions. So what is the future for us at this point? Laid out a lot of tools, a lot of suggestions for you um, and ways to do this. But if you're in the market at this point um, and you're thinking about a first time home buyer uh, loan, uh, please speak with us at the credit union about that. Um, let us look at ways to improve your overall capacity. Be glad to help you with your score. But um, just want to encourage you to put together a workable budget, make the proper investments, and really focus on your overall financial behavior. Again, have that focus on the long term as opposed to short term gains that you perceive at this point. We will get through this process. We can beat this inflationary period. Uh, and with some of the tools and strategies that I've laid out today, I hope that gets you thinking about this topic differently and uh, raises questions for you as well. That's really what it's about. So if you have any questions for me, um, be glad to answer those questions, but wanna encourage you to work with the credit union. Let's get our finances back in shape as we look at uh, the next several months uh, heading into to the end of 2025. Can't believe we're already in August, but uh, I'm hoping that today has generated a lot of ideas for you and some questions. And uh, I'll take some of those questions now. All right, thank you, Todd. For everyone who's joined us for today, <laughs> sorry. For everyone who's joined us today, as Todd mentioned, we'll go ahead and open it up for Q&A. So if you have any questions, go ahead and submit those now. I know a few came in during the presentation, so we'll go ahead and get started. The first one, Todd says, how do you determine how large your emergency fund should be? Yeah, this is a, this is always a tough question because, you know, you, you listen to a lot of, uh, there's a lot of projections about having three months expenses and how large it should be. Um, you know, if you're looking at an emergency situation, you think about your housing expenses and some of your overall just utilities, groceries, those sorts of things, you know, you have to sit down and kind of figure out what that number looks like in real time, you know. So you go through your budget, you take a look at those numbers, you know, how much should you set aside if something were to happen that you would be able to cover, you know, a mortgage or your rent payment uh, for the next couple, for 90 days or more. Part of that 90 days number really comes across to, you know, short term disability at work or some type of plan usually falls within that kind of 90 day period. So we're hoping that you don't have a longer term disability. We just have a shorter term setback. Now, as I've mentioned in the presentation, many of us, we don't really have funds in an account that would even cover potentially even a month. So when we think about how much we should have in that account, well, Ideally, we want to be able to have some cash reserve that would meet our most immediate needs. And that's a number that you have to determine. You know, I can't give you an off the top of the head number that would be reasonable. So you have to think about what your real needs are. But at minimum, what I'm, I'm encouraging you to do is if you don't have even $1,000 to pull from at this time, then we've really got some work to do. Um, you know, uh, this is, you know, at minimum, we need to be able to have, you know, a thousand dollars in an account as i shared in that statistic you know nationally folks don't have the money to pull from so we're over relying on credit cards and other expensive ways to solve problems as opposed to our own cash so what i would like to do rather than just give you a number is i would encourage you again automate the process as i've talked about here today use payroll talk to the credit union about setting up that emergency savings fund so that we can do the proper transactions um, and the real goal here, you know, at minimum, I'm going to say for those who are on the lower end, that's have a thousand dollars in savings. Uh, and then and, and for others, you know, take a look at where your overall situation is at now. If you were to have a hardship, can you cover a, a couple, at least a couple months expenses 
and what would that number mean for your particular situation. So um, rather than giving you an exact number, I just want you to think about the context. And if you look at your numbers and your budget, that should give you a number uh, that's unique to you and your needs. This next question is asking about selecting credit cards that have a higher cashback rewards. I think they're asking for advice on those credit cards um, for items you may spend more in a month. Um, it says, and how does opening a new credit card affect your credit score? Okay. Yeah, two different questions there. So first part of that would be with the uh, cashback rewards and any type of reward or reward incentive. So these rewards often, um, these incentives really are intended primarily to, to get you, they're often overstated in terms of what the actual rewards are. So it's really about um, getting folks to engage in using the cards. I think oftentimes the rewards themselves are, are overstated. Uh, oftentimes in terms of just overall financial behavior, what happens is folks will look at the reward, they will overspend at some point, and then they become uh, indebted and then they have longer term credit card debt. So really what I would be thinking about as opposed to these cashback rewards, which are minimal, um, is really utilization. How are you using the card? Are you able to pay it back? Um, are you using the card in a way that can actually improve your credit score? You know, can you turn a cash expense into an opportunity to build credit? So I just really challenge your overall approach and how you think about um, the value of a cashback card, a card or any type of incentive-based card that offers some type of reward. Mm -hmm. Again, most studies are going to show that, um, you know, the reason for this is really to get you to use the card. Uh, in most cases, folks will overuse the card at some point and get themselves into a great deal of trouble. Um, the other question you had was about opening a card, you know, opening a new card and what that will do to your score. Well, when you open a new card, there is a uh, somewhat of a, you'll have a few points that are pulled from your, your credit report itself and your score will drop. Not much. I can't give you the exact number, but it's going to be a minimal. Anytime you're introducing new risk into your score, opening a new card, for instance, your score will, will, will somewhat drop. But longer term, really what we're talking about is how do you use that card? So, you know, opening, um, if you were, if you're opening just a credit card and thinking about your credit score, that's one, one thing to think about, probably minimal impact to your score, you know, but uh, opening other lines of credit has a, has a more, um, a dramatic effect on your credit score because you potentially change your credit debt ratio by taking on a loan. So, but the narrowest way to answer your question really would be that, you know, opening a new card, it does introduce some new risk into your uh, personal finances. We don't know how you're going to use that. You may max it out tomorrow. So there the outcome would be pretty bad, uh, as opposed to saying you open a new line of credit, you kind of expand your credit mix, uh, and then, you know, that could be a positive for you. But um, if you have any questions about that, the best way for us to look at that question is to have me run a credit report, and I could give you a very detailed uh, answer on that. Uh, just off the top of my head, though, you know, just opening a line of credit, a credit card itself, um, you know, it depends. I hate to give you that answer, but it just depends. It depends on whether or not that, that line of credit will be open or whether it will be immediately maxed out. So the best way for us to do this, let me run a credit report for you here at Trinity that is free as a member of the credit union. I'll do that work for you. And uh, then we can we can actually look at the real impact of opening that line. This next question is asking, what are best practices to manage fixed expenses during inflation? Well, with, 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 there's we always, regardless of inflation or not, with our fixed expenses, you know, those things that have to do with housing and some of the other, you know, I would like to treat, I would like for us to get to the point where we treat our savings as a fixed expense. Our 401k, you know, that becomes fixed expense. Um, when we're looking at insurance products, for instance, again, thinking about risk management, that's how I'd like to approach it through budgeting. What are those potential risks, whether it's through your home, whether it's your car, whether it's health care related, you know, those should all be treated as essentially a fixed expense. Those are the highest priori priorities within our budget. Um, so we'd look at those things first. But again, best practices is for us to look at your overall income and expenses. 
And uh, as I've talked about here, look at your, go back and take a look in the last co couple months at your spending patterns and look at your discretionary expenses. That is, you know, food, other items that are not a fixed expense. You know, where are you spending your money and how might you better spend that money in the future? So if you're making, you know, and this is what I've talked about in the context of inflation today, well, if you're looking at your discretionary expenses and they're kind of all over the map, and uh, if there's any order that you can see within those numbers at all where you're overspending, you know, before you would do any other cuts to these things that I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, as higher priority items, the best practice here is to cut as much from those discretionary expenses as possible and, and increase areas where it has a higher payoff. So that's where you got to go in, look at your budget, cut those discretionary expenses, and as best practice, make certain that you are investing at the highest level possible within the numbers you have in those areas with uh, insurance and investments and healthcare, uh, those sorts of items. It looks like this may be our last question with our time today. It says, what can I do if my income isn't keeping up with inflation? Yeah, this is the challenge for, this is the great challenge for most of us at this point. So when, again, think about the very definition of inflation is that um, as prices across, you know, all sorts of items out there in the, in the market continue to increase at some point, our purchasing power, that's the very definition, you're feeling the practical outcome of inflation itself. So you're not able at this point with your income to keep up with rising expenses. So that leads us really to, to the very reason why we're doing this work today. So when we're looking at the, the best way to get in front of this, this idea of inflation and not being able to keep up, if you have not put together a budget, that's number one. If you have any questions about that, you can see my number listed here. Call me. I'll try to go through that with you. So we want to create a budget. We want to go back and look at those discretionary expenses, uh, expenses, go into your account. We're going to cut everything we possibly can to try to get in front of inflation and help you manage your overall income and expenses. Bring that budget into some type of balance. Um, if, if, if you've done those types of things and we've cut everything down, then one of the last things, again, that I'm trying to caution us on is before we start making shortcuts and shift our financial behavior for, ca for cash needs, Within our budget, make sure that you're you're meeting those fixed expenses and those insurance and investment uh, priorities up front. That may require us to do um, something uh, that would maybe is uncomfortable, which is we might have to get a second job to be able to meet these types of needs, just to be able to get in front of this temporarily. Um, if we've done everything we can under budgeting and we've used all the tools available, then that's where we'd have to look for additional lines of income. So it may result in maybe a second or even, you know, a second job is usually where we'd have to go. We can only cut so far. We can only make so many choices until at some point we're looking for additional lines of income. All right. Thank you so much, Todd, again, for taking us through today's presentation and answering all of our questions. That's going to conclude our Q&A session. If you have any additional questions that you'd like to ask Todd, his contact information is up on the screen. You can feel free to contact him directly, or you can always email events at gecreditunion.org, and we can direct your question over to Todd for you. With that, that is going to conclude today's webinar. Thank you all so much for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.